<laughs> okay. <laughs> so hi guys, we're the Stephen Gregg Show, and uh, we're here to take your burning questions. So hopefully you have something burning inside you, I can tell. And everybody jump up at once. <laughs> uh, Maybe we'll start off with a bit of trivia. Uh, there's a, quite a few shows that Steve and I realized that we work together on without working together on. Right. Uh, one of which was uh, Transformers, yes. Rescue Bots. Yes. You were quite surprised, weren't you? I was very surprised. Yeah. I tried to block. I tried to block it from memory. What the fact that we're on yeah. that show? <laughs> no. No. We don't always work together in the same room, but uh, yeah, just looking through our IMDb's, we realized that we've probably been on 50 or more shows opposite of one another, but rarely in the same room at the same time. Right. So. Yeah, I can tell you're all impressed with that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I think he's very impressed. <laughs> do you guys have questions? We're, we're just going to kind of keep it loose and open. Do, do any of you have any idea who we are? Yeah. You do? Okay, okay. <laughs> Anybody who doesn't know who we are and you're just sleeping in here? Perfect, man. Perfect. <laughs> are you serious? Okay, all right. <laughs> Because we're just going to spend the next hour reading through our IMDb's for you, if that were the case. <laughs> this is my first Q&A at a convention, so Steve's guiding me through. I'm deflowering him in front of you. So. You said I have to pick up the microphone and, and sing in a bit. Yeah, you do. Why don't you start it off with that? No, Would you're you okay. Start That's off? fine. No? Okay. All right. We'll warm, we'll warm to that. Maybe. Yes, we will. All right, here's a question right here. Let's start with you, sir. Thank you for being great. Yes. <laughs> yes. In voice acting, how often do you actually get to work? with other voice actors at the same time? That's a big question, actually. And, it, and it's different for every area of voice acting. So, uh, well, you want to I think, I think yeah, I think uh, <coughs> most of the time, sometimes you work on your own. And there'll be pieces, I think more in animated movies, you work on your own. But uh, in ongoing series, like Star Wars Rebels, we're all in the same room. Yeah. Um, Video there games. was one of the shorts. <clears throat> one of the shorts that came up. We weren't in the same room together. Right. We were um, in different countries while we were recording this. That's right. Yeah. Um, I was actually in your homeland. Yeah. I, I was. I was in Canada. Were you? <clears throat> so. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I was in England. He was in Canada. Who knew? Yeah. And yet it seems like we're together in the same room. All the Warner Brothers stuff, Cartoon Network, uh, Nickelodeon. That's usually all together at the mm -hmm. same time, right? Yeah. Most video games are not. Most video games were in there with just us and the director and their crew. And same with anime. Anime is one-on-one -on -one because it's just too confusing when you're doing the logistics. And then the sometimes, technical, it's, uh, technical. sometimes it's the phone patch, isn't it? Yeah. Again, I do this game, Dragon Age. Uh, I think that's coming out soon, Dragon Age Inquisition. And uh, I think they're in Edmonton in Canada. Uh -huh. So they'll be on the phone. I'll have a director on the phone and an engineer in the room. And... Um, We'll all kind of work through it together. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, who's next? Don't make me come out there. Okay, <laughs> sir. Yeah, for uh, like for Star Wars Rebels. I mean, did you go into like a studio and do that? Like, at, is that Disney or ILM or what? How did this? It's, it's, it's not quite that glamorous. No, we were. No, we recorded at a place called LA Studios. It's a beautiful studio in Los Angeles, but uh, for those shorts because the cast wasn't really assembled yet, they just had to kind of grab us where we were. And for that one particular short that I think we were in together, we were literally recording separate countries over the phone. Uh, but most of the time we are together at LA Studios and they try to get as much of the cast together as possible. How many it's, episodes do you do at a time? Or just one. Just one, one at a time? Yeah, four, hours, four to five hour sessions for one episode and sometimes we have pickups from previous sessions. But yeah, they, they take their time on the show. That's one of the great things about Rebels is that they, they will use up the whole four hours. Some shows try to rush it through, but uh, our director, Dave Filoni, will actually come into the room with us, give us some background, and he, he really pays attention to every single detail. And he's a huge Star Wars fan, too. Everybody in the, the uh, crew is. And so they have people there from Disney and Lucas who are overseeing every step of the way, and we, we really use that four or five hours to its fullest. Yes. Anything in, this, uh, in the Rebels that they will let you if we told you we'd have to kill you, good question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what it is, what Go ahead, to Steve. Have they let you know that, that you're doing something that's going to tie into that? We cannot confirm or deny. 
I'm just a lonely Lasada. Yeah. I I wouldn't even many, maybe maybe. Yeah. <laughs> That's the most definitive answer you're gonna get on that one. Mm -hmm. All right, we, we can't even do a yes or no on that. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, they're really tight to the best, as they should be for something like that, so, yeah. No leakage here, guys, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Least of that kind, anyway. Uh, how about you and then you next? Um, could you just provide us with a list of questions you're not allowed to answer? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <That's funny. laughs> that would take up the whole hour on its own. That's, funny. Yeah. <laughs> That's an excellent question. How about you, Becker? Have you, by chance, been able to go to the set of episode seven? No. Have you? No. <coughs> I wish. I haven't even been to the ranch yet. I want to go so bad. Yeah. Hope that happens soon. Yes, sir. Tell us something about Rebels that we haven't heard yet between the promos <coughs> and stuff like that. Maybe you can tell us about Rebels that we haven't seen yet. Uh... <laughs> No, we're, nope. we're <laughs> <laughs> no, in room shenanigans, that's about it. Yeah. No, nothing else. Uh, somebody who hasn't asked one yet, then we'll come back to you. How about you over here, sir? Give us a quick thumbnail of each of your characters. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, I play Baron Rudol, uh, TIE fighter, a little bit arrogant, a little bit full of himself, uh, maybe not as smart as he thinks he is. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree with that, Steve? <laughs> yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? What about your character? I play Zebarelios. Full name is Gary Zebarelios. Only his mum calls him that when she's mad. Um, he's, he's huge. He's purple. He has prehensile feet. He's a warrior from his planet of the sun. He is of the Lasat species, a new species to the Star Wars universe. And uh, carries an amazing weapon called a bow rifle. And he uh, is kind of the martial artist of the group. It's a different fighting technique than, it's, than has been seen in the Star Wars universe before. And uh, is kind of the, the muscle and the big brother of the group. And definitely a rebel. A lot of bad things have happened to his people, so he's, he's got an axe to grind with the Empire. Okay, how about you? Yeah. Okay, how, how much you working with the Empire of the KMD? With the Jandai? The Pirates of the Caribbean's been a really fun ride when we did the first one. I don't think anyone expected it to be as big as it turned out to be. I think the last Pirates movie before that was Cutthroat Island and that hadn't done so well so um, <laughs> we, uh, we weren't expecting it to be quite so big. Johnny was great. I remember uh, when he, uh, he went in for his wardrobe test and he had to uh, he had the dreadlocks and the rings and the jewelry and the, the teeth and um, he wanted it he, he got it, he got the costumes that, to how he really wanted it to look and then he got the costume designer to add ten more gold teeth and six more rings five more bracelets twice the amount of hair and he went in to show the executives at Disney and they were all taken aback by how he looked and he said well how about how about I lose some gold teeth and I'll lose some of my hair and maybe I'll, you know, lose some of the bracelets and uh, and they went great, perfect, and it's exactly how we wanted it to look. <laughs> so smart man. That's yeah, interesting. That yeah. <laughs> yes. Were either of you or both of you Star Wars fans before you made the job? Answer correctly on that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Who's not a Star Wars fan? I mean, come on. I, you know, growing up, I didn't get to see too many movies at the movie theater, but I, I do remember Star Wars, uh, and of course, it was del indelibly inked in my uh, psyche. So, any time you get to be a part of something that you grew up with is fantastic, and you know, you, we 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 get. We got to do some really cool stuff, you know. Um, I was telling Steve the other night, we were talking about shows we'd done, and you know, I had to do Scooby Doo, and a couple of times I got to say if it wasn't for you meddling kids, you know, to go in the room and sit next to cool. Casey Kasem, and you know, the legend of Frank Welker, that's when I met him doing Scooby Doo, and uh, Rob Paulson, who, you know, was in my first uh, animated series, he played the nemesis to my hero. And, um, and then I get to, to meet and travel with this legend sitting beside me. So, um, no, we, it's, 
I, I get to do Warner Brothers. I get to do Batman. I do Batman the Brave and the Bold, and uh, the Batman, and so many incarnations. Every time I go into a studio and record, it's just a great, fun gig. And so to be a part of the Star Wars world, you know, first with the Clone Wars and, and now with Rebels, is a real privilege. Yeah, the, the great thing about Star Wars is it really does bring out the kid in all of us, I think. And, and uh, to hear an on-camera celebrity of his stature, to be talking about it with as much love and reverence, it's, it's actually kind of unusual. When uh, I work with a lot of voice actors who don't do on-camera, and a lot of the on-camera people, frankly, are, are not necessarily as grateful for this kind of work as, as Greg is and, and as a lot of them are on this franchise. But it, it kind of brings up that kid in all of us. And I was there in 1977. I was graduating high school when The New Hope came out. And I saw it three times that weekend. And I remember mm -hmm. as a teenager sitting there in the row, in I think the first three rows, and seeing the Imperial Star Destroyer come across the screen for the first time. And everybody's head snaps back in the theater. And like you're saying, it, it leaves an indelible impression. And to come back all these years later, and I've worked on a lot of the games too. We both have. Right? Yeah. You've worked on the games too? Yep. And, uh, and very exciting to work on the games, and I love everybody at Lucas. It, that time was Lucas Arts, um, and it was so exciting to do that. But this just takes it to a whole different level now. And uh, I'm I'm a Star Wars, I'm that 17 year old kid all over again. And especially watching the first couple of episodes of the show, it brought back that same sense memory of wonder and excitement that that Star Wars gave me back then. So it's nice to have those moments in our career when we're so busy, we're working on so many different things, and. Most of the shows are really fun and great to work on, but there are these few that really stand out, and this is one of them. <laughs> Far away. <laughs> no, go ahead, yeah. you'd be next. Yeah. Uh, have you uh, uh, explained if there's any differences since Disney took over as opposed to LucasArts? Is, is there a lot changed or anything changed at all? Really? No, I think one of the great things is that, it, from my perspective, there's no difference. And I think that's obviously Disney, um, you know, smartly just allowing Lucas to carry on the the way it's been going and uh, not interfering and meddling and you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So, yeah. and just from our point of view. Yeah, I, I, yeah. To their credit, Disney has really they've they've been an incredible support for this show and, and to get Star Wars relaunched again and, and everything Disney has been touching, I think, uh, and the Marvel franchises too. I work, both of us work a lot on the Marvel franchises and, and Disney has really, you know, they, they certainly have their input on things, but they, they have been so incredibly supportive and wonderful to just kind of stand back and, and let the people do this who have been doing it forever. So, you know, from my perspective also, and in, in several different incarnations of shows that Disney is now a part of, it's, it's been nothing but a great experience. That's the best possible Yeah, it is. No, it's really good. I, I'm a big fan. <laughs> I'm a big fan of them. You had a question over here? All right, so my question was, uh, have you read uh, John Jackson Miller's novel or any of the other tie-in material? Probably? Not yet. I have them. I haven't read them yet. I will, though. Okay. It's on the list. Have you? I have not. <coughs> yes. <laughs> you know, I always say it's the role that I'm doing at this moment in time. I know that sounds like a twee, cheesy answer, but I think that's the case. You know, I, uh, I got to do um, a Western last year. I had a fun time doing that. I think that's going to be out sometime this year. Um, it's with uh, Demi Moore and Kiefer and Donald Sutherland and Brian Cox. What is it called? Forsaken. Um, Coming soon to a theater near you. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I enjoyed doing that because it was something different. Um, but no, usually, usually what I'm doing right now. So right now, let's see, what am I doing next? Tuesday, I'll be, I'll be doing uh, Turbo for oh, nice. Disney and Pixar. So. Yeah, my answer is the same to that question. I and mean, there's so many characters that have become benchmarks for me. Um, uh, Cowboy Bebop, Spike Spiegel, was a, a big benchmark in my life just because it led to so many other things. Um, and led to Tom and Tsunami, and, and which in itself launched a whole bunch of other careers. Um, but like he was saying, it is the, the characters that we're working on now. And I'm just grateful to be working. And I invest as much into Soldier A as I'm going to do into 
you know, Wolverine. He never stops working. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we're, we're uh, especially us guys who are only do voiceover. We consider ourselves to be the blue collar workers of the he industry. He brought his recording studio here. I did. Yeah. In his room. <laughs> I have it. Well, mini version of it. But yeah, but uh, like you said, uh, whatever we're working on now. So Monday, I'm back on the regular show and love working with those guys. So that'll be my favorite character that day. Tuesday, I'm, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Over here. Yeah. I was wondering, I know Steve was in it, but did you guys see the documentary? I know, I know that voice. And how did you did it portray voice acting properly? Yes, it did. Well, Don, John DiMaggio uh, headed up that production, and he's a he's a dear friend and one of the greatest of all time, in my opinion. He's, he's an incredible voice actor, and he did that really as a love letter to the industry. And he did it because a lot of voice actors don't get any recognition, and there were some faces on there that you may have never seen, you may have never recognized otherwise. And it was it was really nice. I thought it was really nicely done, and it was an accurate uh, um, impression of what what it is like behind the scenes. And it was also filmed in a very casual way, too. He set up a little studio for some of us. Some of it was filmed in people's homes. Some of it was in the recording studio where we were working. But it really was in our home or working environment. It was great. It was one of the best things I've gotten to do. We had a lot of fun working on that. And he's got enough footage he could do 10 more of those films. It was kind of ridiculous, actually. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but uh, I have worked with John many times, and he is larger than life character and extremely <laughs> talented. Yeah. Yeah. One of the funniest people on the planet too. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, can you do some Wolverine for me? I'm the best there is at what I do, but what I do isn't very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think it was, was there a question back here? There we go, sir. I have two questions. Sure. Sure. I'll answer the second question. Um, not too much direction. I mean, we'll we'll go through uh, some shows like um, on Batman, Brave and the Bold, and uh, Beware the Batman. And Trey Romano will will read through the script uh, one time, and then we'll get notes or suggestions, or if there's a new voice um, that I'm doing, we'll find that voice. And so you just kind of put yourself in the in the uh, in the voice director's hands, and you know, it's higher, lower, um, uh, more gravelly, or so you find the voice that way. Um, and then there's some shows where you maybe you've done a character a couple of times, and you come back three months, four months, five months later, and you need a, a reference, a reminder of what the voice was, so they'll play back the reference. Uh, Transformers, uh, Rescue Bots. Um, I came in to uh, take over voice from uh, Tim Curry. So I had to find, by listening to his uh, representation of Dr. Morocco, uh, I had to find that, mm, Tim Curry, you know, that, that sort of nasally, and it's an interesting voice that he does on that as well. It's almost three voices in one. Uh, so you have to find the tone of the voice and then the performance through that. Um, so. <coughs> Yeah, and, and uh, I don't think we're allowed to say how many episodes we've recorded yet. So that's probably a Dave Filoni question, and he'll deflect it even more than I just did. <laughs> <laughs> but on Rebels, uh, we, he gives us a lot of context on Rebels, but like the best directors, I think, like Greg was saying, they'll, they'll set the context for us, but they let us do what we do. They hire us because they want our take on it first. And often they'll just let us roll and, and then kind of uh, tweak it and, and shine it up a little bit. Yeah, they, they, they let us play, and that's why I think the joys of doing voiceover is uh, you don't have to come in too early and do hair and makeup and costume and learn all the lines, and you go into it, that's why I love it, you go into a recording studio, a lot of times on a studio lot or Warner Brothers, places with a lot of history, and um, you get to work with these a lot of times, I mean, I'm, no, I'm sure you guys know them, but unsung heroes, very talented people, um, and um, you get to play. 
and have fun and uh, <coughs> laugh a lot, giggle, uh, try and remain focused and do your job. <laughs> um, but it really is a fun way. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's a pretty good gig. But you're right here. Um, well, I was telling Steve, you know, voiceover wise, I've been on camera for many years in, um, in theatre and someone said to me years ago, maybe 14 years ago, 15, or maybe more than that, um, you should try voiceover. And I said, oh, okay. Um, and I went uh, and met with an agency. I was very naive at the time. I thought I'd just walk in and they'd sign me and I'd start working. And, uh, <laughs> and I met all the agents, and I think I just, uh, I think they must, I went in with such energy and tried to do so many voices and act really wacky and zany, I think they probably thought I was some kind of, some kind of drugs, um, but um, to their credit, they signed me, and um, the first uh, animated series I got was actually, um, it was from a comic book I'd read as a kid. Um, I got to play the title character, and the guy who created it was from my hometown, and the guy who played my nemesis was Rob Paulson, and he's still one of my favorite uh, voiceover guys. He's probably right up there. He's just um, super talented, uh, gracious, humble guy, and um, I learned a lot with him on one side, Jeff Bennett on the other, and Maurice LaMarche across the way. So crazy. That was that's how my journey in voiceover started. And I started by accident. I was actually a struggling musician playing in an R and B band during the eighties, opening for heavy metal acts. And so that didn't go so well. But my day job at the time, I had a few jobs. My day job at the time was working in a mailroom and I was a driver for a low budget film company called Empire Pictures. And we were famous for films like Reanimator and Ghoulies, a lot of those films, the Puppet Master movies. And so I was a little man on the totem pole. I was picking up condoms in the parking lot and driving the boss's dogs to get de-skunked. And uh, the head of the mailroom and head of the drivers was uh, an actor. Everybody else in the building was an actor. And uh, he was casting up this Japanimation program <coughs> called The Giver. And uh, they needed a guy who could do some creature voices. And I happened to have the deepest voice in the mailroom. And so uh, he said if I came in on a weekend, he'd feed me free breakfast and free lunch. That was all I needed to get into the door. And he wanted to try me out on this thing. And if it worked out, they might pay me to actually be on the show. And they were going to pay $7 a line to do this thing. I, I thought this was great money for just yeah. messing around. So I walk into the studio. And uh, at that time, the technology wasn't quite what it is today. And it was in a tree house. It was literally in this guy's tree house in his backyard. He, was, he had a band and he had a little recording studio that he built in this crazy tree house. And it was a place called The Cave. The back of the tree uh, backed up to this hillside that he had carved out and he had built this little fortress up there. It was the worst recording studio I've ever been in. It, it, was, <laughs> it was not uh, soundproofed at all and he was nuts. As we're in the studio, he's outside hanging from his knees with a chainsaw trimming the trees and so we had to keep stopping him and we ended up having to re-record everything that we did in that studio in another place but basically the very first thing I did was to walk up to the microphone and just go... <laughs> And they said, all right, you're hired. And 26 episodes later, I was the main villain on the show and learned how to act by stealing from everybody else in the room. <laughs> and uh, just kept doing it for fun for about 10 years until finally I became an executive at that same company. I stayed at that same company. I was head of marketing. I was traveling to France for the Cannes Film Festival. Had a corner office in Hollywood and hated it because the people I was working with were just very shady Hollywood types. At that time, everybody had uh, transitioned. And uh, so I finally booked a, a job for 7-Eleven. I booked the campaign for 7-Eleven. I was that guy who says, oh, thank heaven. And I thought, okay, well, this is going to pay for my house now. And I uh, quit my job, and then the union went on strike, and I was out of work for a year and a half. Wow. So uh, kind of clawed my way back, and, and many, many years later, it turned into something I can support myself with. My, up till five years ago, my parents were asking me if I had a backup plan because they didn't believe I could make a living doing voiceover. <laughs> 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 How about somebody who hasn't asked one? All the way in the back of the room. I didn't probably ask this a lot, but I didn't love your response to me. Like, you just, um, you're just telling me. How was it going to be a part of the show? Like, what did you think about Frank Walker and the 
I was an eight-year-old fangirl in that room. Uh, to hear Peter Cullen say, roll out, for the first time. Mm -hmm. I mean, Peter is, he's, he looks like old Hollywood. As he's classic gentleman with a, a thin mustache and perfectly coiffed hair. And he dresses up for work. He comes in pan, pressed pants and a shirt. And he's, he's not as tall as I thought he would be. Peter's probably five, seven, maybe, something like that. And smokes like a chimney. He walks up to the microphone and he roll out, he says, for the first time. And the walls are flexing, our bones are vibrating. I just couldn't believe that that really was his voice. They, they, they don't tweak it at all. It sounds exactly like that. And Frank, I've been a gigantic fan of Frank uh, forever. He's done every voice in every Disney movie you've ever heard for every creature. And plus uh, Scooby-Doo and uh, Freddy and uh, so many, so many other things. Frank is, is a legend in my mind and one of the greatest gentlemen of all time too. And I, I got to work with him on Scooby-Doo also and I got to say the meddling kids line. So it was my second time in the studio with him. Uh, so I didn't gush as much, but I still did. I, and just to hear them together, hear Megatron and Optimus together in the same room, I, I was like that squealing fangirl. All of us in the room were. And there's a bunch of veteran actors and all of us were like, oh my God, I can't believe we're here. <laughs> it was great. And they've become dear friends now. They're, they're amazing people. Frank is one of these guys also who, the first time I met him on Scooby-Doo, I was a, a little green back then and terrified in that room. It was a scary room in, at Warner Brothers. And uh, Frank took me aside and he gave me his home phone number and he said, if you need anything, just give me a call. It's, you know, it's a crazy business and I'm happy to help you out with anything you need. And uh, that's, that's why I love our community. It's, it's like that. So. Oh, thank you. Have a good one. Oh. Was it, uh, for Craig, how was it with, uh, with the Garfield? 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 Oh, Garfield. Garfield. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, yeah. They, no, they were, they were Garfield sessions. I played Nigel with Ferret. And um, they were solo sessions because it was for a movie. Usually for a movie, you, you do the sessions on your own. And uh, Tim Hill, the director, um, he wanted a lot of improvisation, so I would go, and they were a lot of fun, I would go into, into the studio of Fox or um, wherever we were recording, and he would uh, give me an idea of the scene, I would see the scene, and then he would sort of say, okay, just make, make something up. So there was one scene, I think all the animals were eating all the food, and I started, I think my, my cat was like that, it was Nigel and Ferry, it wasn't it, all right, hey, hey, hey. and I started singing the song and doing a rhyme and doing a poem, and like, you know, I laugh, it was like that. Like, and um, that ended up going in the movie. The, I don't remember the rhyme that I did, but... Um, oh. oh, that was it. The female ferrets sing this song, Nigel, hey, Nigel, hey. Female ferrets can't be wrong, do you know what I mean, hey? <laughs> so, <laughs> they, um... They, <laughs> I've never seen that. Those are the moments where you, you kind of, when you're improv you, you, you do oh, something and you don't remember what you did, and then you see the movie and you go, oh, I did that. Mm -hmm. um, same thing happened talking about Frank Welker. I, I was uh, lucky enough to be invited by the delightful Chris Zimmerman uh, to go to Cartoon Network and do an improvised episode of a cartoon, which apparently is very rare um, that this happens. And it was with Phil Lamar, Greg Delisle, uh, Frank Welker. And uh, they put us in a recording booth at Cartoon Network and just let us start creating a story and characters. And it ended up being, um, I think we went to, we went in time traveling mode back to the days of King Arthur. And I played the campus lady of the lake that said me. I was like, oh, I am the lady of the lake, Arthur. What would you like? So we go shopping, get some shoes, should you? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we went, we did about an hour of silliness and lots of different characters. And then they sort of molded the story together. And, uh, and then we, we got some semblance of an episode from it. But things like that, just, you know, fun. So in answer to your question, Garfield, um, yeah, fun. Fun? Yeah. So you know what we the closest I got to Bill Murray was uh, crawling up his pants. Uh, my character crawling up his pants at the end. I, I didn't. I couldn't fit. Not that I want to. I'm sure it's warm and snuggly. So I stop. Next question. Did either of you meet Don Lafontaine? No. Uh, I traveled in his footsteps a lot. When I was uh, recording for Toonami back in the day, we were recording in the same studio. And I would get a stack of uh, of uh, sides for what I was going to be recording that day. There was, you know, maybe three, four sheets. And Don, who had just been in there, he'd just come by limo, 
and had just left by limo, his stack was about that thick. Wow. And he would just bang them out. Really? And so I was just trying to absorb some of the essence, scrape off DNA from the microphone. I always wanted to meet him. Me too. I, and I heard he was a really warm, wonderful mm -hmm. guy. Me too, yeah, I always yeah. wanted to. One of my heroes of voiceover, too. Mm -hmm. Got time for one more desk. Okay, who hasn't asked a question? Who has a burning one going? Okay, how about you, Ray? No, I, I used to make music. Uh, I, I started out doing musical theatre in the West End of London, doing Andrew Lee Weber shows, and, uh, and then I had a record deal and released some pop songs in Europe, but not these days, I haven't. I mean, apart from singing as Nigel the Ferret <laughs> and Garth Brooks <laughs> doing Starlight Express. And apparently I did sing a song last night on this very stage. <laughs> he did. He did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and my musical talent was never developed. So I was, a, I was a rhythm guitarist in this band, and I wasn't very good. Uh, but I, I play every once in a while, and the only thing that I've ever recorded professionally that made it to an album was as a gift to the fans from Call of Duty, from the Call of Duty franchise. And in the zombie level, for those of you who are familiar with us in Black Ops, uh, there are four of us who literally our only function is to slaughter zombies. And so we did what we call the very zombie Christmas. And we had a composer put together classic Christmas songs, arrangements of classic Christmas songs, and we'd just sing about slaughtering zombies through the entire thing. And we put out an album, and it was called The Very Zombie Christmas. We were called the Kings of Carnage. And we put it out on uh, iTunes, and Activision shut us down and <laughs> served us with a cease and desist. Because we, <laughs> we, <laughs> we didn't ask for permission first, and, uh, and we should have. But you can still find it if you look on uh, YouTube. Just look for A Very Zombie Christmas, and they're all there. It's you don't get some of the chatter in between, which was drunken and... Uh, <laughs> anyway, but there's plenty of that in the songs. I did, I did rap at the end of um, a, a game called Shadows of the Damned, which, again, <laughs> Steve reminded me, we were, we were the two. You were my Johnson, and I was Garcia F. Hotspur. Hey, and I don't remember the voice. <laughs> 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 oh, my goodness. And, and we also found out that we both voiced Rocket Raccoon, right? Yes, we did. I was a bad impression of his version. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that's what the fans are saying. <laughs> it's cruel. Oh, wow. Well, I don't care. I, I, was, I was cheering him. I actually retweeted that. Um, oh, and I'm singing on Doc McStuffins also, the show Doc McStuffins. If, for, if you have little kids, I've done several episodes of that, so I'm Commander Crush on that, and we sing, I feel better, so much better. And also, I was a kangaroo. I was a kangaroo on that too. All right, mate. Boxing kangaroo. You yeah. tie the Tasmanian tiger. Yeah. You love that game, right? <laughs> and then last week, last week I was singing on. Um, I, I just started doing the Lion Guard, which is the new uh, Disney uh, series, uh, following on from uh, the Lion King. And um, I was singing last week on a, on a great, great song they've written for that. There's music and songs in that show, and it looks fantastic. So. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together, please. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank you.